BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Lord Revan wanted Rizzio killed during this tennis match. But Darnley said no. Lord Darnley wants it done tonight. He wants his wife to witness the murder because David Rizzio is her closest friend, her personal secretary, and she's very pregnant and Darnley hopes that if she sees him being horribly brutalised she might miscarry and die in the process. She's the Queen. If she dies, and the baby dies, then Darnley's own claim to the throne would be undeniable. It's late Saturday afternoon, the 9th of March, 1566. An indoor tennis court, Palace of Holyrood, Edinburgh. Darnley serves to Rizzio, who returns it with an elegant stroke. Point to the Italian. Watching... From a bench built into the wall of the court is Henry Yeer. He's Lord Riven's retainer, here to keep an eye on Darnley for the boss. Yeer hates everyone here and he especially hates tennis. Yeer is very pale, his eyes rimmed red because he hasn't been sleeping. He thinks in binaries, good, bad, man, woman, for God, against God. A former priest, now ferociously Calvinist. He hates those who don't embrace the truth, those Catholic holdouts. How can they defend a church so corrupt, so murderous, such a betrayal of the one true faith? Yeer eyes David Rizzio at the far end of the court. He is small and sly and foreign. He's only a singer. So what's he doing giving the Queen advice? The rumour is that he's a papal spy. Rizzio wins the set and smirks. Darnley scowls and turns away. Yeer sees him up close, 21, handsome and arrogant, his lips a furious, tight little O. Rizzio sees whispering. He knows something is going on, but something is always going on in court life. The whispering has been intensifying, building up to the current session of Parliament, which will finally, irrevocably divest the Queen's rivals of their land and power and titles. This Parliament's proclamations will take Scotland by the shoulders, turn her away from England to face Europe and concentrate power in the Queen's hands. They're almost there. Rizzio is winning this game, but can't let his delight show. Rizzio has more to hide than Darnley. At one time, Rizzio shared Darnley's bed. He loved him then, and he still loves him. This yearning is a great secret. Darnley is handsome and rich and charismatic, but he's also a braggart, a liar, a whoremaster, and a weak, weeping, drunken fool who screams demands at the Queen in public. He would have served him forever, but Darnley came to trust him and let Rizzio see who he really was. It pains Rizzio to admit it, but Darnley is a poor prince. It wells from one spring, Darnley's father, Lennox. A poisonous man, Lennox has turned Darnley, convincing him he should be on the throne instead of her. And Darnley cannot forgive Mary denying him equal status. She promised him the crown when they married, but is holding it back because of what she sees. Darnley disappearing on hunts. Drinking, carousing, Darnley refusing to counterseal his Queen's official documents. None of her orders have authority without his seal added to hers, and so the business of government grinds to a halt. They fought a war of attrition until Mary upended the table. 
She had a copy of Darnley's seal made and gave it to Rizzio. Darnley seethes because of it, but the choice was never Rizzio's. He's just doing what he's told. Darnley must be able to see that. Rizzio knows his life is threatened. Of course it is. He's a proxy for a queen. They resent her power, her sex, her religious devotion, her pregnancy, which has the potential to carry on her Catholic line. Across the tennis court, Darnley lifts the ball and serves. Rizzio watches it come straight at him. He steps nimbly to the side, swings his racket back gracefully and meets the threat square on. From the frosty shadows, Yair watches. Mary, Queen of Scots, is six months pregnant, warm and young. This early Saturday evening, she is hosting a supper for her friends in a small turret room on the second floor of the James V Tower, just off her bedroom. Every day brings her closer to safe. Her breasts are full, her cheeks are flush with extra blood. New life is coming. She doesn't know that, right now, half the nobles of Scotland are downstairs in the dark, silently storming her palace. Two hundred of them have already overwhelmed the guards and secured the gates. At this very moment, as she raises a morsel of meat to her mouth, Lord Riven and his man Henry Yeer are taking the stairs to Darnley's apartments on the floor below Mary's. No one in the supper room hears anything over their kindly chat. Mary is reflecting brightly to her illegitimate half-sister, Jean, Countess of Argyll, that Edinburgh is cold, but that this is the false despair that signals the end of winter. Change is coming. Good change. Mary's suite of apartments, directly above Darnley's in the tower, is a mirror of his. Both have a large formal audience chamber served by the same grand staircase and both have a connecting passage from that room to their respective bedchambers. A private staircase joins their bedchambers so that they can visit each other without anyone else knowing. They may be heads of state, but they are also a young married couple. Each of these bedrooms has two small rooms leading off into the turrets that make up the corners of the James V Tower. Mary likes her little turret rooms. This is where she's hosting her twelve guests this evening. Mary listens to Jean talk on the subject of gratitude, nodding as her sister runs out of thoughts. The women's eyes meet and they smile their fondness for each other. There is a companionable pause in the conversation, and Rizzio fills it with a question. Everyone must answer, he says. What is the sweetest portion of music you have ever heard, and why? Mary smiles and draws a breath to answer. On the floor below, in response to a gentle tapping, Darnley opens the door to the formal stairs. Lord Riven and Henry Yeer stand before him. Riven's cheeks are hollow and a cadaverous green. Darnley looks at what Riven is wearing. What is that on your head? Riven doesn't answer. Behind him, eighty men, crouched, Silent and armed heavily are creeping up the stone stairs to Mary's apartments. Let me in, hisses Riven. Darnley admits the two men and quietly shuts the door behind them. Riven staggers into the audience chamber, then sallies on into the bedchamber. Yair scurries close behind, hands out as if he expects Riven to topple backwards. Riven has been in bed for two months, dying. The conspirators have nominated a corpse to lead them. Darnley is annoyed. It suggests they have no faith in the scheme. Still, Darnley is a stranger to self-doubt, and already quite intoxicated. 
The arrangement is simple. They are to go upstairs by the private stairs, cross Mary's bedchamber and enter the audience room, unlock the main door to the stairs and let the soldiers into her parlour. Come on. Darnley leads them to a small doorway which leads to the narrow stairs that spiral up to his wife's bedchamber. Then he stands back to let them pass. No, croaks Lord Riven. You go first. Darnley is surprised. He shouldn't be first through the door. Surely he's the most important person here. He motions to Yeir. You go first, he says. Yeir looks to Riven, but Riven raises an arm in front of him. No, Yeir says, nodding to Darnley. You. This is how Darnley finds out he is a pawn and not a king. The conspirators are using him. He will not be king when this is done. That was never the real plan, he thinks, was it? But Darnley is drunk and the palace full of soldiers, and if Darnley doesn't do this, his father will be very angry. It's too late to back out now. He teeters forward and takes the first step up to his wife's bedroom. The warmth in the supper room is suddenly cut by the curtain being yanked aside. Darnley barrels in and everyone stops talking. With uncharacteristic concern for the guests... He carefully shuts the door behind him and lets the curtain fall back. Mary sees Rizzio's eyebrows rise slowly. In the sudden, brittle silence, Darnley walks across to a heavy oak chair against the wall and drags it noisily to the table, parking it next to Mary. His smile vanishes. He juts his chin defiantly as he sits down next to his wife. Then he reaches over and snakes his arm right around her waist until his hand is on her swollen belly. Mary stiffens and puts her hand on his to stay it. He squeezes Mary's waist as if being affectionate. Mary flinches and jams her thumbs under his palm. She breathes a tiny no and Darnley pretends he is offended that she is rebuffing his affection. Outside the supper room, Riven sweeps his hand to the passage. Go! he hisses to Yeir. Let them in! Yeir pushes the massive oak doors outward. Eighty heavily armed men press in on him, shoving him back inside. When Riven hears the clatter of feet, he knows it's his cue. Holding out a steadying hand, in case his weakened legs buckle, Riven clanks over to the supper room door, wrenches it open, sweeps back the curtain inside and stands there, filling the doorway. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. There are gasps and giggles. Riven is wearing a bed shirt, tucked messily into a bizarre suit of mismatched armour, he has a steel cap on his head, a deliberate piece of kit designed to stop someone stabbing him in the top of the head. Riven's eyes find Queen Mary sitting at the centre of the gathering, and there at the far end of the table, at the head, as though he were the man of the house, as though he were married to her, sits David Rizzio. Oh, my good Lord Riven, coos Mary, what is this you are wearing? As they all register the stamps and cries of armed men outside, the warmth and curiosity in the room evaporates. Replaced by alarm, 
Mary tries to stand, but Darnley holds her down. Riven raises a hand and loudly orders the Queen to hand over David Rizzio. Shock lifts Rizzio to his feet, and he knocks over his chair as he backs away from the door, pressing himself into the window recess. Mary, struggling, manages to stand, but Darnley gets up too, still holding her waist. Lord Riven, says the Queen, by what authority do you dare order me? It is intolerable to witness my sovereign be treated with contempt by a lowly foreigner, says Riven. I demand he surrender himself to me this instant. Mary looks at Darnley. Did you bring this man here? I have no idea how he got in. I don't know what's going on. Lord Riven, as your queen, I order you to leave this chamber right now. Get out, or I will charge you with treason. Riven isn't worried about that. Everyone is in on this. He has a contract in his pocket, signed by all his fellow conspirators. If Mary charges him, she will have to charge four-fifths of the nobles of Scotland, including her own husband. Riven? Get out now, Mary commands again. Everyone is still. Riven clanks a defiant step forwards. The room recoils at this outrage. The men at the table stand up, but Riven draws a loaded pistol and cocks it in the presence of the Queen and shouts, I will not be handed! Armed men are shouting and clattering through the audience chamber now as Riven draws a dagger from his left hip and lurches towards Rizzio. Mary instinctively tries to block him and this is when everyone else arrives. Five armed men rush in from the audience chamber, roaring. They charge across the cramped quarters, shoving past Riven, grabbing for Rizzio, tumbling over one another with swords and daggers drawn. Rizzio, terrified, flattens his back to the wall and draws his own dagger, but his hands are damp and he drops the blade. As he scrabbles for it on the floor, the men reach for him, pushing and shoving so that he staggers head first across the room, crying, Sauvez-moi, madame, and darting behind his queen. The supper guests scatter out of the way. The table is toppled. Candles are knocked to the ground. Sudden darkness. There are unsheathed swords everywhere. Rizzio squeezes his queen's skirts tight, pressing his face into the embroidery. Mary shields him, standing tall, hands spread. She has assumed they dare not come past her, but abruptly sees that this is wrong. Darnley is with them. They feel protected. Darnley reaches for Mary with two hands, as Riven shouts at him to look to his lady wife, let no ill befall her. Darnley's hands go straight for her belly. He squeezes tight, hoping to hurt the usurper inside. That's it, my lord, let no ill. These statements are Riven's defences. I tried to protect the lady, he'll say. You all heard me. Quick-thinking Jean, Mary's half-sister, swoops down to pick up the single sputtering candle from the table. She holds it high above her head. In the flickering half-light, everyone can see Rizzio cowering in the window recess behind Mary, holding onto the back of her skirt. Darnley has both arms tight around his wife's middle. He tries to drag her away, but Mary stands her ground. Riven brays at Darnley to get the Queen out of the way as Henry Yeer and five others lunge for Rizzio, but Mary doesn't move. A man called Kerr brandishes a cocked pistol and shoves his face within an inch from hers. He draws his hand down her body to Rizzio's clenched fingers. She realises that she is no longer Kerr's Queen. He growls at her as he tries to prise Rizzio's fingers from her skirts. 
Mary stands defiant as another man reaches over her shoulder to jab at the cowering figure of Rizzio. The cold metal blade brushes her neck. A mess of invading men swarm in front of her. Mary knows every single one of these men, knows their histories and family connections. They would all be divested by the coming Parliament and she can have them executed for tonight. Still, Mary stands her ground despite Darnley tightening his hold. Rizzio is hunkered down behind her, holding tight to her skirts while she leans back, bending her knees to make herself immovable. Then Patrick Lindsay, a fanatical follower of John Knox, picks up a chair, swings it wildly at her, just missing her belly. Mary flinches, and it's enough. Darnley lifts her off her feet, now Kerr has Rizzio by the hair and is dragging him out of the room. The last Mary sees of David is a hand taking a fistful of the velvet on his back and another grabbing his thigh. As they lift Rizzio, he shouts, Sauvez-moi, madame, sauvez ma vie, justitia, justitia, in a panic-stricken jumble of French and Italian. I am a dead man! Then they're out of the room with the screaming trophy, his terrified protests receding. Reverend slumps against the wall by the door, sweating death. He calls to Mary, Be not alarmed! We will not harm him. We will not harm you, madame. We are removing him from your rooms. He has been taken down to your own dear husband's chamber, madame. They haven't gone downstairs, Lord Revan. He doesn't understand. He shakes his head and blinks. This is how Revan finds out that he is not in charge of this coup either. Henry Yeir stands looking at the wasted meat scattered and trampled on the floor. The shocked queen over by the window. Darnley, drunk, is not smiling any more. Yeir thinks she might not live through the night. Compassion betides him. A proud young woman, visibly with child, is attacked by men working in concert. We are cowards, he thinks. What we are doing is wrong. Our queen is trampled meat. But then he remembers that she's Catholic. And they are here to save the soul of Scotland. Empathy drains out through the soles of his feet. He crosses the bedroom to the passage and enters the audience chamber. There he finds 80 men pressing in around Rizzio, punching him, thumping him. He's down. They crowd around him on the floor. He has eight seconds left to live. Everyone has their knife out because everyone is going to stab him. That's the deal. These men are cowards. Rizzio came here alone, and he will die alone. A blade enters his shoulder, his lung, his hand. These men are cowards. A boot hits his face, breaking his nose. There's a knife in his back, his neck. He is stabbed in the arm, the stomach and legs. Blood slides from his wounds and he's gone, but they keep stabbing him. It takes quite a long time for everyone to have a go. Men queue up, men move forward and bend down and retreat. This is a roll call of Scotland's great men. Great men stab, and having done their duty, they step back. An eerie silence falls. The supper room has emptied, leaving Mary and Darnley and Riven and Jean. Mary has her arms circled around her belly to protect it. You brought that here, she shouts at Darnley, pointing at Riven. You brought him here to frighten me, your wife, your queen, when I am with child. Darnley sees how it looks. All the levels of wrong on top of each other. 
You were fucking that Italian pricklet anyway. You know that's a lie. He does, but he says, no, I don't. Mary leans in close to him and whispers, so that Jean can't hear, Who was intimate with him? Who? Darnley can't meet her eye. Quite suddenly, Riven grabs a chair and sits down. Bring me wine, he calls, addressing a servant who isn't there. Mary is cupping her belly and shouting at Darnley. You brought them here. Don't deny it. Uh, Madame, if I might. Everyone is surprised to hear Riven's voice again. A wife must listen to her husband and give him obedience. Is it not in the marriage vows to love, honour and obey? It is God's will that if a woman defies a man, they must be divorced in the eyes of God. Has not God said so? The suggestion that Mary is not married is a direct threat. Her baby must be born into a valid marriage and must be admitted by Darnley as his. Otherwise, it will be denied the security of the throne. Without those seals, even if the baby makes it to the throne, it will surely be usurped, and that always leads to murder. Mary looks to Darnley to refute the point, to say she is his wife, that this is his child. Darnley doesn't. Darnley is Lennox's son. He tried to lift her by her belly to make her miscarry. He is going to hold her belly hostage, withhold an admission of paternity to get the crown. He's a Lennox. He is his father's son. And nothing is beneath his spite. Not even infanticide. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Henry Yeir is walking out through the front gate when someone grabs his sleeve. Where do you think you're going? Yeir looks up. Five of tonight's new guard, their clothes mismatched and the weapons crude. He points up the hill. Town. You allowed to leave? You know me, says Yeir to the tall officer in charge. It's Sheriff Thomas Scott, Riven's man from Perth. I'm Riven's man too. Oh, I. Scott's about to wave him off but stops, looking past him to the city. Lights are appearing. First one, then another, then five or twenty, and they're coming straight for the palace gates. The men of the city of Edinburgh, four hundred citizens, walk in formation, carrying torches that form a river of fire. These are the ordinary men of the town who have sworn to keep the peace, called from their beds by the keepers of the watch. Strange goings-on had been noticed down at the palace, lights on and shadows slamming into windows. Provost Simon Preston is at the head. They are all of a single mind, armed with lances and torches, fuelled by fierce loyalty to the Queen. The river of fire pools in front of the entrance to the palace. Simon Preston raises a hand and the men behind him stop. They stave the end of their lances on the ground. The guard stands stiff and nervous, but Yer is pleased, in a way. He thinks the keepers of the watch are going to find out what they have done here tonight. He thinks they might charge them and kill them, and he's half glad that it'll all be over. He sees Preston look up to the Queen's apartments and the window of her bedchamber. The facade of the James V Tower is only about fifty feet broad, 
with a turret at each corner. In between the turrets, facing outward, are two big windows, one above the other, one for the Queen's chambers, the one below for the King's. Preston tells Scott that something was seen to be happening in the Queen's apartments. Sudden movements, lights going on and off, someone falling against the glass. He wants to know what's going on. And now they're all here, he can see that the men are not Mary's official guards. He doesn't recognise any of them. Everything's fine, says Scott. You can all go home. Aye. Where is this you're from? Up Perth way, says Scott. Just fill in and I'm sheriff up there, by Lord Riven. Riven? says Preston. How come you're guarding the palace? That's not for you to do. Grips tighten on lances among the keepers. Feet shuffle and scrape as men part their legs to steady their stance. Preston looks up at the James V Tower again and sees all the light spilling from the windows in the Queen's apartments and the King's below. To us this seems kind of strange. You're not the usual guard, eh? Scott doesn't answer. He smiles vaguely and looks over his right shoulder, mapping his men from the corner of his eye. A moment's pause. Preston advances and raises his left arm. He gives a nod, and the men behind his left flank shuffle forward. Preston raises his right arm, and the men on that side do the same. Both sides are now spread out in a semicircle, curved around the gaggle of strangers on the door. The shuffling stops. Preston calls the order, and the keepers have their lance blades pointing at these unknown guards. Simon Preston looks up at the Queen's apartments and shouts, What's happening in there? Is the Queen in there? In Mary's bedchamber, everyone stills and listens. Riven is slumped in a chair, drinking wine. He drops his cup. Mary's lips part as if she's going to take a breath and call for help. The nearest guard raises the tip of his sword to her chest. Make a sound, lady, and we will cut you into pieces. From outside they hear the provost shouting up to the window, Is the queen in there? Revan looks at the guards. The guards look at the window. Darnley comes alive, steps over to the bright window and throws it open. He hangs out, shouts down, Hello! Preston is delighted to see Darnley. I'm Provost Simon Preston, the keeper of the watch. Good for you, says Darnley, smiling and looking over the arc of lance-bearing men, pointing their weapons at the palace guard. What's going on here? We thought we heard trouble. You did? We found a papal spy. Two of them. They tried to get away, but we've caught them and dealt with it all. They had letters on their person. Oh, says Preston, smiling up but still not convinced. Yes, says Darnley. So you can all disperse. Go home now. This doesn't feel right to Preston. He doesn't want to leave but he's being told to by the king consort from the window of the queen's apartments. What else can they do? He turns to the men and orders them to go back to their homes, thanking them for their service. The men turn and clatter their way back to town. Darnley remains at the window, smiling stiffly. Yeer joins the watch and walks into town amidst the throng. He's already so mired in despair that nothing can penetrate his mood. Nothing touches him, not the cold or the chattering camaraderie of men returning home after a false alarm. He walks for a long time, down the dark lanes to the grass market, and finds himself outside Father Adam Black's front door. Adam Black is notorious. He's everything 
Henry Yere isn't. He's a 40-year-old Dominican friar, well-off, cheerful, lascivious and much travelled. He's sympathetic to the transgressions of those who come to him for confession because Black is a sinner himself. He's suspected of being a spy. Adam Black's front door is small and pale blue with a large brass knocker brightly buffed. Yair thinks he has been brought here because he desperately needs to talk about matters of faith. He wants to know if he's been mistaken in his conversion. He wants to ask why God is making men choose between religions like this when they can't. He's guessing now, but this feels like an answer of sorts, finding himself here at a priest's house. He tries the door. It yields. Henry Year steps from the street into Father Adam Black's parlour. He wants to do the right thing, make the right choices. It's a gamble. He saw Rizzio's face cut through with a blade. Then he's standing by a bed, in a small room, a stifling room that smells of wax and old men's clothes, and Yeer finds himself smiling. He doesn't have to decide. It's been done for him. He's holding a knife he's never seen before, holding it in his right hand, which is covered in blood. It's warm blood, and it's dripping onto the floor in a way he finds amazing. The blood of the lamb. He's washed. He doesn't have to decide anything anymore. It's all been decided for him. A woman is screaming. It's Father Black's sister and housekeeper. And then men are here. Men make him drop the knife and men hold his arms and they light candles and see Father Adam Black in his scarlet, soggy bed and he has been stabbed over and over in his lovely, holy face. Night has fallen in the palace and Mary is trapped. She is fully clothed, sitting on the side of her bed, ordered to retire there by Riven. Everyone is leaving. She still doesn't know for certain that Rizzio is dead, but she thinks he must be. It has gone quiet out there. Riven keeps sitting down in her presence, another impertinence, and Darnley leans over to talk to him in low tones. They look around furtively. It's pathetic not wanting her or anyone else to hear what they are saying. Her husband is an imprudent idiot. He's going to get them both killed. Lady Huntley comes in. She's been allowed to take out the broken crockery to tidy up and straighten things. She approaches Mary and looks at her intensely. David asks Mary. Lady Huntley nods and bows her head sadly. She does an uncharacteristic thing now. She puts her hand on Mary's wrist. It is less of a caress than a brief transfer of heat from an old body to a young one. God rest her soul, she says. The guard lets her out, and Mary watches her go. Mary knows they're going to kill her tonight. Once they've built up their courage, once they've discussed it and sorted out the ramifications, they'll kill her, and then Darnley. It's the prudent thing to do. It's what she would think to do. She needs to stop this. Across the room, Riven gets up. He's exhausted, and his armour is heavy. He staggers a little, but he catches himself, and then raises a hand to Darnley. Go down, he says, sweeping an arm towards the private staircase. At first, Darnley thinks he is delirious. He snorts and looks at Mary for confirmation that she saw Riven give him an order. 
Mary tips her head. What do you expect? She thinks you're a hostage as much as I am. Let's go downstairs, Lord Riven, he says loudly, as if it was his idea all along. As Darnley passes her, Mary reaches out and grabs his forearm. Stay with me tonight, she whispers. No, he says, and takes a step beyond her towards the stairs. She whispers, they'll kill you too. But Darnley walks away, following Riven through the doorway and down the stairs. She bolts the door behind him, but it's symbolic. The guards are still in her audience chamber. Mary is left, sitting on her bed. Lady Huntley comes over to her queen and sits, thigh pressing to thigh. Taking her hand, Lady Huntley weeps silently. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. In a distant room across the palace, two men in their early thirties are finishing a meal, telling old stories, gossiping and drinking, oblivious to the coup. They're both connected to Lady Huntley. George is her son, and James Bothwell is her new son-in-law. Both men, who are quite drunk, work closely with David Rizzio and give the Queen their loyal counsel. There's banging on the door of their chamber, so loud and formal they think someone is playing a joke. Entrez! shouts Bothwell in an affected French accent. They both gawp as a servant opens the door from outside to reveal their caller, Lord Riven. In his full set of armour, ruddy-faced, puffing hard, Riven clanks into the middle of the room and collapses in a chair, listing to one side as if his armour is digging in. Riven sighs. Look, We've taken over the palace. We've killed Rezio and taken the Queen hostage. Tomorrow we'll dissolve Parliament and restore the exiled lords. Everyone knows and everyone is coming back. Most of them are already here, hiding in town. The Queen, who you have been grooming and kowtowing to all this time, she's out. He shifts in his seat. Seems to forget what he's talking about. George hands him a cup of wine. Lord Riven, is the possibility of a treason charge something that concerns you? No, there won't be a charge. We've got Darnley. George suddenly feels terribly sober. This is a disaster. James and George had plans. Darnley is a spoiled child. They never even bothered counting him among the pieces on the board. We've promised him the crown matrimonial, puffs Riven, so he'll basically do what we tell him. George sits down and leans forward, hands on his knees. A nervous smile crackles on his face. He's a rather changeable person, my Lord Darnley, though, isn't he? Aren't you even a little worried he'll change his mind? No, says Riven. He signed a contract, ordering us to do all of this. We made it seem that we were following his orders, but I don't want you two to worry because you're all right with me. I'll see to it. Don't be alarmed. We being, says George, we, us, the lords of the congregation, the chase about lords. George nods as if he's struggling to understand. The chase about lords, who rose in objection to Darnley and Mary's marriage, are now holding the Queen hostage until Darnley gets the crown matrimonial. No. He gets the crown, and they get their lands and titles restored. 
after he's gone and the sound of him clanking down the corridor fades in the distance, Boswell says quietly, they all know we're loyal to her. It isn't within Riven's power to grant us mercy. I know. James and George stand still in the darkened room, listening. The soundscape in the palace is unfamiliar. It's busy and chaotic compared to the usual orderly night guard. The invading soldiers are all over the palace, elated by their win. There is no discipline. It bodes ill for the rest of the night. He'll go back up and tell the others he came to see us, says Bothwell. Then they'll realise that they'll have to kill us. They can't escape through the main doors, and the only other way out is through a back door. They can see the small shuttered window at the far end, a semicircle of muted grey moonlight. James goes towards it. George follows, eyes trained on his friend, expecting a door to burst open, a troop to arrive, swords to swing, a cry of alarm to go up, but no one stops them. They stand outside in the palace garden in the dark. The cold pinches their cheeks. Suddenly they hear feet tramping in unison nearby. Full of adrenaline, they take it as a cue and they bolt. All night, the major players are gathered in Darnley's audience chamber. His father Lennox is there with Riven, Morton and all the lords who were overlooked and sidelined by Mary. These men are all landed aristocracy. They see themselves as the great men of history. But their plans will be usurped by a dumpy widow woman carrying a piss pot. Lennox dominates the conversation. He is tall, thin of body, slightly withered about the face. He fed Mary his idiot son and now he's working him from the back. Persistence has paid off. He can hear Mary pacing in her bedchamber upstairs and tells the company, That's the problem. Like Rizzio, a problem. Her and Rizzio's baby. He smiles to his cuckold son, who knows he is not a cuckold. Darnay smiles back, thinks there is nothing worse than his father smiling. No good has ever come of it. Yes, but we wish the lady no harm, says a short stubby man, Lord Lindsay, who is always the weak link. We will hold her and the baby prisoner in Stirling Castle. For how long? asks Lennox. For the rest of their lives, if necessary. So we will not kill her, says Lennox, apparently concurring. That is decided, says Lindsay. But what if the lords who have been visited by a Lord Riven and let go this evening come back and try a counter-coup? Take the Queen from us and use her as their head? Lindsay makes a sad face and glances at Darnley. I can't say. Darnley isn't going to either. He pours himself a drink and turns away. If they kill Mary, will they kill him? Lennox wouldn't hesitate to allow his own son's execution if it were expedient. Darnley knows that. Just then, Morton, the second man to Lennox, saunters into the audience chamber without permission or invitation. A fury rises in Darnley's chest. Morton should look to him for permission to enter, not just because these are his rooms, but because he is the king. He will be their king from tonight. They should all remember who is in charge here, what the plan was. Unsure of his authority, feeling himself threatened, he reaches for his dagger just to touch it, to comfort himself, but he finds it gone. He had it earlier. He knows he did. He should give an order now in front of everyone and then they'll see that he's in charge. He shouts to the guards to come in from the stairwell. 
Get David Rizzio's body out of her rooms, he orders. Take it downstairs. Darnie turns back to the company, and in the lull before the conversation restarts, they all hear the Queen pacing back and forth in her bedroom. His wife is up there, waiting for them to come for her and the baby. Then they hear the sound from the stairwell, Rizzio's bloody corpse being rolled down the stairs. It sounds very wet. Darnley remembers what they did to David. He feels sick. The Master of Guards comes back in alone. He whispers to Darnley that they have done what he asked. He also tells him that the porter asked, and was permitted, to strip the fine clothes from the body. Darnley doesn't understand why the guard is telling him this. He wants to slap him, but the guard keeps rattling out details. Rizzio's bloody body is now naked and on display, lying over a trunk, and, per Lord Morton's order, the only dagger left in the body is Darnley's. The guard holds his eye, bows, and retreats. Who was the guard? He was no one. But he has changed the course of the night, snatched history from the hands of the great, because on hearing this, the realisation dawns on Darnley that they are putting his hand on all the dirty business. It's a set-up. He will not be made king. That was never the plan. He scans the room with inebriate eyes and admits it. These men don't think he's a king. They think he's an idiot. Over the course of the next hour, he gets so drunk that he passes out on his bed and wakes at six o'clock with a start. He sits up. Pain sloshing around his head picks his steps through the retainer sleeping on his floor and makes his way upstairs. The door is locked on the other side. Mary! He daren't shout because the others mustn't know he's here. Mary! Let me in, please. It's me. Let me in. Let me talk to you, Mary. The door opens and the Queen stands there bedraggled and red-eyed. She grabs his shirt and pulls him into the bedchamber. She locks the door after him and turns and cups his hands in hers. I thought they killed you in the night, she hisses angrily. Darnley sinks, sobbing, to his knees. I'm so sorry, he laments, burying his face in her skirts. He isn't really sorry. She knows it and he knows it. You only repent what causes you trouble. She pulls her hands away. You broke your oath to protect me. You lied, and you'll do it again. I won't. He scrambles to his feet and dries his nose with his sleeve. They're planning to hold you hostage in Stirling Castle for the rest of your life. They're going to keep you there, you and the child. They'll hold you there too. I believe so. She watches him closely. He got a fright, and he wants to change sides. But I can't trust you, Henry. Wait, he says, and pushes past her. He scurries down the stairwell and comes straight back, holding two vellum documents roughly folded in three. She opens them and reads. It's the contract they all signed agreeing to this uprising detailing who is getting what, and it has a list of signatures of everyone involved and their respective seals. Now she knows exactly who can be trusted and who can't. Now she knows what they want. You lied to me, she says. Darnley has no defence, but says quietly... I can lie just as well to them. B 
BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. All day Sunday, frail and hungover, Darnley does what he is told by the great men. He proclaims Parliament officially dissolved. Anyone who came to Edinburgh to attend Parliament must leave the city within the next three hours or risk being arrested and forfeiture of their life, lands and goods. There is a sudden exodus. The city is deathly quiet. Donnie makes a second declaration. The exiled lords are no longer being charged with treason and their estates will not be confiscated. He declares that they can safely return to Scotland without fear of arrest or prosecution. They're already in Edinburgh, most of them, hiding in different houses around the city. From the homes of allies they come out of the shadows. They meet each other. They are seen walking in the streets. For the conspirators... Everything is working out. On Sunday at lunchtime, Mary starts to miscarry. The conspirators don't trust the Queen's own midwife. They send her one of their own. This midwife visits the Queen and reports back. If they want mother and child to survive, they have to release her right now. They discuss it in the King's chamber. They won't do it. They won't change her conditions. They won't let her see the apothecary. They don't care if she sees the pregnancy to term or dies. And now they're all calculating the consequences of her dying. No queen. No heir. No opposition. Mary fakes a miscarriage on and off for six hours. And Lady Huntley stays by her side the whole time. Scream, she whispers into Mary's ear, and she does. Hold your back with two hands and writhe, instructs Lady Huntley, and Mary does. They think it means that Mary and the baby will die. Lady Huntley stays with Mary, rubbing her back, dabbing her brow and making her sip Madeira. And while she weeps and wipes and murmurs comforting things to Mary, she also whispers this. George and James got away. They've mustered a small army out in Dunbar. They'll fight for you if you can get there. The only person not convinced by all this is little Lord Lindsay. All day long, he hangs around Mary's apartments like a bad smell, coming and going without asking permission. Mary cries out again and Lady Huntley makes her retreat to the commode room. What they need is for the guard to be called off and they need to get rid of Lindsay. Cry out, says Lady Huntley, and Mary does as she's told. Oh, poor, poor child. Lord, have mercy. Thinking Mary and Lady Huntley are in the commode room too long, Lindsay bursts in through the door to find Mary taking a pee on her chamber pot. Determined not to show any deference, he just stands there, listening to her urinate until she is done. Lady Huntley lifts the chamber pot and takes it out of the room. Lindsay is annoyed to be made to look so petty and stops the old woman. He searches her roughly in case she has a secret message from Mary hidden on her person. He finds nothing, waves an imperious hand and tells her to take the piss pot away. Lady Huntley walks, warm pea sloshing in the pot that she has covered with a cloth. Under the pot is a letter from Mary to George and Bothwell. Mary says she's coming to meet them on Monday at midnight. She'll be on the road to Dunbar. Bring an army. Darnley has convinced the conspirators that Mary will sign their pardons. She will ratify Protestantism as the official religion of the country and she will grant him the crown matrimonial. 
On Monday evening, a full delegation assemble in the audience chamber and kneel grudgingly before their wincing queen. Darnay stands by her side, looking pleased with himself. Gentlemen, my queen is feeling unwell and must take to her chamber. But you have won. You are forgiven and she will meet your demands. Please have them transcribed and when she is well enough later this evening she will sign a document to this effect. You have my word. Darnay is lying. Mary wouldn't do this but she is asking him to do it. Suddenly Mary grips her side and cries out. Lady Huntley rushes out from the bedchamber and holds her up as her legs buckle. Even this elicits no pity from the triumphant men. They have turned the tide. These great men of history, they control everything. They draw up the statement, sign their own names and give it to Darnley to hand to the Queen. And then they decide to go out for dinner to celebrate. It's a mistake. Mary rides ahead of Darnley and the others through the empty city streets. She is cloaked and her horse's hoofs are muffled with sackcloth. Darnley can see her very clearly and though her hood is up, he can tell from her straight back and high chin that she's exhilarated. Darnley has left his father back in the palace. I can't leave him here, he whined to Mary as they slipped through the shadows and out through the wine cellar. They'll kill him. Then they'll kill him, Mary had replied, tugging at his arm. Stay, and they'll kill you both. She needs him to admit paternity of the baby when it comes. That's why she's taking him, not because she loves him. She doesn't love him at all. When they reach open country, they give the horses their heads. Ten miles away, George Huntley and James, Earl of Bothwell, are waiting in the dark, watching the road for their future. Some eight weeks later, Henry Yeer stands on a platform looking down at a large crowd. The afternoon sun is behind him and he can see their faces very clearly. Standing next to him, his gallows brother, is the Perth Sheriff, Thomas Scott. Yeer smiles at him, thinking how nice it is that they are both Riven's men, but Scott is crying loudly. There are two other men up here with them, richer men, Lairds, Mowbray and Harlow. They were there that night. Yeer saw them stab David Rizzio, but they are being kept away from Scott and Yeer. A man walks forward to the crowd and shouts things. By order of Lord Darnley, David Rizzio, murder. These men before you here held Royal Pardon, Mowbray and Harlow to be released. Per justice. The two lairds are led from the scaffold, helped down the steps to the street below. Suddenly, there's a hooded man and a minister in a long grey cassock, holding a prayer book. The shouting man says other things, words, by order of, upon the night, did willfully, and there did, Father Adam Black. Praying is going on incantations but that's a waste of time because God hates him and Yeer knows that a rope is pulled down over his neck and then Scott's a wind picks up suddenly as the ground beneath Yeer disappears on the morning of the christening of their son James the sixth Mary Queen of Scots and Lord Darnley the King Consort have this exchange. You need to come to the christening, Henry. You need to own him publicly. People need to know he is your son. No, I shan't come. Darnley is drunk. 
His eyes are sliding around as he tries to focus. She wishes he'd sit down. She's worried he'll fall on the baby. He will not be safe if you don't admit him as your son. Well, maybe I don't want to be a father. It's a bit late for that, she says. You may have fooled me, he says, pouring a cup of wine and spilling some on the stone floor. Oh, he steps a toe in the wine and it soaks into his slipper. I didn't want it. It might not even be mine. He swings around and looks at her, but Mary isn't listening. She is looking at the red claret soaking into the tip of his silver velvet slipper and thinking about David Rizzio. Tell me this, he said. What is the sweetest portion of music you ever heard? Everyone must answer. Darnley sees the expression on her face, the profound sadness in her eyes, and follows her gaze to his toe. Mary looks at baby James. You think he might be Davy's child? Don't know, mutters Darnley. She holds up the little baby suckling on her fingertip. He has a frizz of ginger hair and skin as pale as a bright new moon. You think this is Davy's baby? Darnley shrugs and slurs. Who knows? I can't be his father. I can't. He's right. He won't be the baby's father. He'll be murdered in two months. He won't live long enough to be a father to anyone. What happened to Mary is so frightening that she never goes back after she leaves Holyrood with Darnley. She shudders at the memory of those rooms. The doors to her apartments slowly close. They stay shut for over 200 years. The entire floor is abandoned. It's not until Victorian times that the apartment is restored. The rotten floorboards are ripped out and replaced, the whole floor raised by six inches. In the 21st century, her rooms have glass display cases with many items carefully labelled, traditionally associated with Mary, Queen of Scots. Many were made long after her death. The curators are too honest to misdate them. A brass plaque is screwed into the wooden panelling of a window nook in the old audience chamber. You have to stoop to read the words. The body of David Rizzio was left here after his murder in Queen Mary's supper room, the 9th of March, 1566. And the floorboards below it are stained red. Blood traditionally associated with Mary, Queen of Scots. <laughs>